he told me uh, just a few details of something that's going on over there in Kenya politics, and it has to do with artificial intelligence in the area of what's called a deep fake. You all know what that is? A deep fake is where someone uses artificial intelligence to mimic a real person, not only their body and their face and their mannerisms, but also their voice. And I've noticed uh, what few times that I saw a deep fake come across on YouTube. YouTube had some kind of little notation there saying that this content made use of artificial intelligence uh, somehow, some way. But apparently over there, they have framed the vice president with uh, supposedly some kind of something that he did. I didn't get all the details, but something he did, and they're saying that they have a recording of it, but it's a deep fake. But they are still proceeding forward. You know, it's politics. When you have enemies in politics nowadays, you don't, you don't treat them the way civilized people should treat their enemies. You go after the kill. You get them completely out of the way. And um, so that's, that's going to happen here in this country. Mark it down. They're going to pull, they're going to make some video of Trump or Vance or somebody that is important in Congress and they're going to bring them down. They're going to use that uh, even, if it, even if it never sees a courthouse. In America, you've got to worry about the, the, how the public perceives somebody. You could destroy somebody's life with things like that. But I'll say this too. Um, I have no doubt at all that uh, the things that pertain to Jeffrey Epstein and all of his shenanigans on that island, they were probably videotaped, records were kept of who visited when and so on. Bill Gates, Bill Gates' wife divorced him over Epstein. She found out that he was on that plane going to that island and she handed it to him. And uh, she divorced him over that. And the same thing I'm hearing is going on with Sean Diddy Combs and a list of people that basically there are videos and pictures and recordings of things that took place while those people were there. Very powerful people. People in government, people in big business, and so on. And um, I tell you, then I, I think the NSA, which keeps secrets on everybody in this country and around the world, uh, I have no doubt at all but what the NSA probably is used also as a weapon. Uh, against judges, against uh, congressmen, against people in the White House, uh, you name it, that's, that stuff is done. There's no doubt about it. With America being technically the, one of the most powerful nations in the world, the people who sit in high places in this country, that makes them some of the most powerful people in the entire world. And a position like that, well, we used to play King of the Hill. Did you ever play King of the Hill? Did you ever play that game where you threw the football up in the air and some dumb kid caught it and everybody had to, yeah, well, I know what it's called, but yeah, we played that game too. And um, you play for keeps. Okay, somebody ends up with the football, they're dead meat. And, um, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that's, that kind of stuff goes on uh, in American politics as well. So 
what an interesting time we live in and uh, just tell God thank you that God wiped your record clean amen amen Acts chapter uh, 2 and 3 Acts chapter 2 I wanted to bring this out last Wednesday night and didn't quite have enough time so I want to point it out tonight just some interesting things that I find uh, in the scriptures uh, we'll read um, let's do this let's let's read the last few verses of Acts chapter 2 and then the first part of chapter 3 and then we'll go to prayer uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 41 then they gladly they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls not bad for one sermon amen and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the Apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions let me put that up on the screen here yeah they sold their possessions and goods and parted them all to men as every man had need and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved and now chapter 3 now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour and a certain man lame from his mother's womb care uh, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms and it basically he was asking for money or food or whatever and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said look on us and he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something of them then Peter said I love this, this is one of my favorite places in the book of Acts silver and gold have I none but such as I have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk kind of kind of fits in with what I've been telling you if God don't give you what you ask for don't worry he'll give you much better and wouldn't it be much better for this guy to get up and walk and now he can he can eat what his hands bring in he can do his own work and I'm sure he didn't I'm sure he didn't complain at all and he stood up and walked. Let's pray. Uh, I have a prayer request right, right off the bat. I, I mentioned this man, Craig Shaw. He's one of my good friends. Uh, we went to Bible college together, and uh, we've kept in touch over the years. And um, just, uh, I love him to death. He loves me, and he, loved, he knows what we're doing here. He watches every now and then. Uh, he met a young lady there at Bible college named Denise and they got married and um, Denise uh, I found out I called him yesterday I just I mean it just hit me call Craig so I called him he happened to be he lives in Tulsa but he happened to be in Oklahoma City with his I think it was his son for a, a, some kind of doctor's appointment and um, he didn't have time to talk he was just sitting down to eat uh, with his family and so I didn't keep him long but he said that his wife uh, has uh, leukemia and that last week she was in the hospital all week with some kind of sickness or infection or something like that and that's just been weighing on my heart real heavy and uh, Denise is a wonderful lady and uh, good Christian family both of them and uh, so would you play, pray for Denise Shaw and brother Craig and his family tonight all right father in heaven I come before you tonight and I thank you Lord for Jesus Christ and Lord the, the gift that we can offer people that they may ask for money they may ask for food they may ask for gas money gasoline in their tank Lord when we give them such as what they ask for and then we give them a Bible we pray with them Lord um, 
I pray, dear God, that somebody that we have helped over the years, Lord, that we could see just what you've done in their life since that time. Father, we know that our labor is never in vain in you. And so, Lord, we just know and understand, God, that the people that you send to us to try to help out, we know, Lord, that it, it does some good somehow, some way. So, Father, bless this church, and may we always be a giving church. And I pray, dear God, for my good friend, Craig, and his wife, and I pray, dear God, that you would give her healing in her body from the leukemia. And I pray, Lord, that uh, this sickness would not uh, take her life. But, Father, Lord, you could bless them, give them many years together uh, the way you have Lisa and I. And I just, Lord, my heart just is, is for them. I pray, dear God, that you would help them, and give them comfort, and give them grace, give them healing. Father, bless your word tonight. Open our eyes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, going back to Acts chapter 2, um, what I have there on the screen with those, uh, those cells there, that is uh, the first day of conception. Uh, and that is what that human life looks like. It is a one-celled organism, but it's not going to stay that way. It then becomes two cells. Two cells become four. Four become eight. Eight becomes 16, which becomes 32, which becomes 64, and so on. And always in the early phases of, of the life of that human baby, amen, human being, every cell is alike. And, I, and when you look at... Uh, these verses here in Acts from verse 41 on down, uh, you see the number one there several times. Number one, they, they're 3,000 souls, yeah, but they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. Uh, and it says in verse 44, they, had all, they, they were all together and they had all things common. Well, that's, that's what happens after conception is that every cell is exactly alike they all take in food uh, it's a common food among them and they all pretty much do exactly the same thing uh, and in verse 45 you have some people that sold their possessions and and they gave just as what everybody needed that's what they gave them uh, in verse 46, there they are. There's that number one. They continued with one accord and uh, did have singleness. That's the number one of heart. Uh, praising God and having favor with all the people and, and so on. So you see a unity there. You see a oneness there with that original church. Now, a lot of, lot of people have come over the years, 2,000 years, having read... Uh, this part of the book of Acts, believing it, but attempting also to try to imitate what came naturally for this early church in, the, in those early days. All of them have failed. All of them have. Um, there are some who look at this, and so maybe the pastor or whatever, maybe the Jim Jones or the David Koresh will say, uh, everybody, empty your bank accounts, bring them in here, sell all your property, bring the proceeds here, uh, and really, in most cases, that's a cover-up for the guru is going to get rich. And he, he cons these people into believing that this is what God demands of us. God demands that we all sell everything that we have and bring it all in and so that everybody is equal and everybody gets the same and nobody can get more than anybody else. David Koresh did it, Jim Jones did it. They all have tried it, but the thing is, you don't see a commandment here. You don't see Jesus or you don't see Paul or, well, Paul's not around yet. You don't see Peter. 
telling everybody that they had to sell everything they had and bring it in so we could give it out to everybody else. Peter didn't command it. James didn't command it. John didn't command it. And God didn't command it. It's just what happened. And in those early days, they were there all in Jerusalem. They were all together. And so everybody was fed. Everybody was taken care of. But just as with these cells, at some point, some of them start being different. Not wrong, just different. So some of the cells turn into different things, and they have different needs. And uh, we know that from Jerusalem, uh, persecution came in and scattered that church there in Jerusalem, and they went into Judea uh, to escape the persecution in Jerusalem, and they started preaching the gospel there. People were getting saved in those areas of Judea, but then persecution broke forth there, so they had to go into Samaria. And this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. First Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then now here we are at the uttermost parts of the earth. And don't, just don't believe anybody when they tell you, oh, the Bible says we got to have all things common. And, and, um, and, and I did this back in my Bible college days. Uh, I, I had this understanding that denominations were evil and um, that we all, how come we don't all just believe the same thing the way they did in the Bible? Uh, and one of my, one of my uh, instructors told me, he said, Mike, you're at the age right now where you uh, have the luxury of not having enemies. And I had to think about that for a while. He said, the older you get in this life and the longer you continue in the ministry, you're going to make somebody mad. And they're going to stay mad at you for the rest of your life, and they're never going to get along with you. And uh, boy, was they right. They were absolutely right. Uh, and there are churches that are just different. We, this church, is different. Uh, I have been criticized by men that I know fairly well. They haven't criticized me to my face. It's always been behind my back. But I've been criticized because we no longer are in the denomination. Well, I'm not going back. Okay, I'm not changing what we do here just to accommodate. I remember uh, years ago when uh, we decided to start a Christian school and a daycare. Um, some people in the church were for it, some were not. And we had a lady that had been here for years. She's like me and my family that had been here for years. And we ran the school and running the daycare, and she came to me one day and she complained. She said, I just feel like that, that that school is just taking the whole church over. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the bottom line was, she told me in no uncertain terms, she said, if you don't shut the school down, I'm leaving. I hated it, but she just wanted it her way. And... Um, this church has changed in some things over the years, but in the things that are important, the Word of God, uh, the fellowship that we have, the, the, the worship style that we have, I can guarantee you we're singing the same songs that I sang back in 1974, 1975. We're singing the same songs, doing it the same way as it was done then, and... Um, God is blessing it. But we are a unique church. We're different. And so for us to respond the way other churches respond or for us to, to act the way other churches uh, act would not really work here. And I'll tell you this. If we were still in a denomination, there's no way we would be able to be doing what we're doing around the world and then with Kenya and everything else. Uh, the denomination would want to own that. They would want to own it. Or certainly they would want a piece of the pie. They would. They would want their share, what they feel like is their share of the money that comes in. 
and it's just it's not for them it's not for them it's for God's kingdom amen but that's that's what happened at the beginning is that they were all there had everything common later on we're gonna find out about a man and his wife that they're like the first hypocrites mentioned in the scriptures first church hypocrites who am I talking about Ananias and Sapphira go down in history as being the first church hypocrites in church history. There's been many that followed thereafter. We'll, we'll understand that as we move along. All right, now, uh, chapter 3. Something better is what I call this because that's what, as I was thinking about this, that's what came out when Peter said, silver and gold have I none. I mean, the guy wanted money, right? And probably... Probably everybody it wouldn't be, wouldn't have been wrong to give him money But Peter and John they just didn't have any Okay silver and gold have I none but such as I have I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth Rise up and walk now You're gonna find out that all of this all of these things that happen here in the book of Acts It's always a, a, a preaching thing that ends up happening they're gonna they heal this man and then lo and behold when they start finding out what happened Peter's got a sermon ready to preach about it amen or God gives him one and so in verse 7 he took him by the right hand and lifted him up uh, some some faith healers may want somebody like this to stand up on their own well if you've not walked your entire life how do you even know how to so he just took stuck his hand down there took him by the right hand lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength now you've seen somebody that's been lame for years either with the, like if they're lame in their hand the, their muscles atrophy and they diminish. They're just almost no muscle tone at all. Same thing with the legs. But what, what happened is when God healed this guy, he grew muscles. He grew nerves. He grew blood vessels. He grew everything that his legs would need to move him around. And I would say even including working his brain so that his brain knows how to control all this stuff because look what happened when he in verse 8 he leaping up he jumped he didn't just walk he flew up which means that God had worked something in his brain as well to to control all of those muscles and nerves and everything like that he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple Walking and leaping and praising God Leaping and praising God There's a song that goes with that um, I don't know all of it But anyway, I know that part But I mean, he's enjoying this, amen He's not just going Oh, this is great He's bouncing off the walls in the temple, okay And I can just imagine some people That have been there all their life going Well, that kind of stuff shouldn't be done in the temple, bless God You know, the type, you know but, hey, enjoy it for the first time. So verse 9. Now all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John... All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wandering. I mean, this is, uh, I guess you could say, the first big miracle of the church age. It was done by the apostles. Um, and, 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 and I'm going to probably be uh, doing some kind of teaching on this aspect of healing faith healing and so on does it happen to everybody does God as these faith healers will say to you Benny Hinn will say God God owes everybody a miracle 
Everybody, when they ask God, should receive their miracle. In fact, they'll, they'll call their people up. Come and get your miracle. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. For God to save me and to change my life and to change my mind and my heart concerning his word, for God to do the work that's been done in me, that's a miracle. That is a miracle. And if I'm supposed to get one, I'm pretty sure I've got that one. And if God does anything else for me after that, well, that's just, that's just whipped cream on the pie. Amen. Amen? And I like a lot of whipped cream. on. You're going to find them on Thanksgiving dinner. You get me a pumpkin pie, and I'm going to pile it up like this. Little dollop nothing. I'm going to dollop the daylights out of that thing. But anyway... So, and, um, yeah, I am. Uh, <laughs> give me a can of it, and I'll be. <laughs> and all the people saw him walking and praising God, verse 9. And they knew that it was he that sat with wonder. And the lame man was, at verse 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together into the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. Now, I like this because this is actually prophesied healing this man's legs now I, I want you to think of something there is a there is a theme especially you see it in the New Testament but you see it also typified in the Old Testament and that is that theme of standing okay um, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego stood when everybody else fell and they fell because they didn't believe in God, they didn't trust in God, and I would say even Jews in Babylon at the time, they all fell down and they worshiped that idol. Uh, you have Paul in Ephesians talking about uh, stand therefore and having to withstand in the evil day. In Galatians, stand fast therefore in the liberty where Christ has made us free. And all throughout the scriptures, we are, we are called to stand, to stand, to stand. Uh, I've used this analogy before. If, uh, somebody is happened to be walking through some forest somewhere and they all of a sudden are surrounded by a wolf or maybe a bear is coming, a black bear, we have them now in Missouri. Um, running is the last thing you want to do because as it, as it is, number one, recognize that God put a fear of you inside that beast. I don't care if it's a wolf. I don't care if it's a bear. Their first reaction is a reaction of fear because they see a man standing. And it's, and it's put into their DNA to be in fear. Um, and sometimes you stand and you make noises and you clap and you just do everything you can to let that beast know that you're there and that you have authority there and so on. What the beast will try to do to you is get you to run. If it's a wolf, they'll bite at your heels, your ankles to trip you up. Now with you laying on the ground, now who's got the advantage? Wolf does. The bear does. Don't, and climbing a tree that doesn't get you away from bears either. They can climb higher and faster. But now that you're on the ground, the wolf knows to go right for your throat, and there you are, and now you're probably going to be a dead man. But a man standing has that weapon of fear that he puts into those beasts. And so there's a lot to be said about that. God uh, uses the term in the Bible, walking uprightly. Humans do that. No other creature does that. Humans do it. We walk uprightly. We stand uprightly. It is our natural, unless you're a Sasquatch, it's a natural thing for us to do this. I had to throw that in there. Okay? And so, um, if for some reason you have a weakness, and let's, let's make the knees here that enable us to stand sort of a picture of if we're standing for God and if we're right with God, God strengthens us to be able to stand. But in our weaknesses, 
We're going to fall. So look at what Job said. In Job 4, verse 4, Thy words, oh, I like it already. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. God's word does that. Days that you don't think that you can stand, days that you think that you're weak, you're not going to make it, you're going to collapse, you're not going to be able to hold up, thy word will give you a strength in your knees. Isaiah 35, verse 3, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm, look at that word, confirm, with firmness, the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. And he will come and save you. And remember, we've been learning about Satan on Sunday night. Remember, he is a beast. For all the exaltation that he gives himself and for all the, the powers that he has, he is still just a beast. And he cannot escape his nature. And so when God gives you the power and the ability and the authority to withstand him, uh, what, is, what does the Bible say? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You maintain your stand. And what, and what did the devil want Jesus to do? Fall. He either wanted him to fall and bow down to him, or they took him up to that high place and he wanted him to jump down. Either way, he wants Jesus going down. And then he, could have, then he thinks he could have authority. But Jesus stood. And so you see that all through the Bible. Verse 4 again, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man, look at here, look, then shall the lame man leap as an heart. That's the first thing that man did was jump as an heart. Let's talk about a deer. You don't see deer when they come up to a barbed wire fence, get on their belly and crawl underneath, do you? No, they abound over that thing. They jump high over that thing. There's a, I can't remember what, what breed it is, but there's like a, like a field deer or some kind of antelope in, in Kenya, it's in the, in the uh, Rift Valley, that when they, are in, when they encounter something like a leopard or a cheetah or a lion, when they start running, they start bounding real high. They jump real high up in the air. And what that is, they're flaunting their ability in front of that predator saying, Look what I can do. I can fly. And that's why they're doing it. They're hoping that if they can impress that predator that they'll stop chasing them. That's why they do it. And so, um, the, the, then shall the lame man leap as an harp and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall be, oh, I like this. Because we're talking about dragons too. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Look at that. In the places where the dragons were living, because it was a wilderness, God changes the habitat. And when you change the habitat, the animals that were used to living there, they don't like it anymore. They, they can't live there. There's too much water here. There's too many reeds and rushes. Dragons can't handle it. And so, the, I mean, this is what we're told, like, with the environment and, and the conservation. And, and I believe it to, in some ex, to some extent uh, what is done as far as the land conservation and so on. I think there should be plenty of places in the state of Missouri for deer to roam, I do, and that we have to manage the deer population. Uh, right now, there's way too many does. I'm already seeing dead deer laying out everywhere all, all along the road, and so we have to manage that 
in order, to, in order for it to all to be balanced out. And, um, but when you change the habitation of something, you change the creatures that live there. They just don't live there anymore. Uh, I still don't know who invited the armadillos. When I was in school, we heard about armadillos and they said, they're in Texas, we never see them. Possums on the half shell, they are. So anyway, but this is the promise that God made was that he would get involved in this and he would bless. And the first thing he started blessing was the people that are lame, they're going to leap like a heart. They're going to jump and they're going to jump high because God has strengthened their feeble knees. In a day when you don't feel like you can stand, call upon the Lord, he'll stand you up. Amen. Think about, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for a minute. They already know that the penalty for not falling down is the fiery furnace. Now that doesn't say welcome to me. Okay, there's no welcome sign on a fiery furnace. I don't, I really, really don't want to burn up in a fire. Can't tell you how bad I don't want to burn in a fire. Um, so, if I'm Meshach and I'm told, listen, if, if we don't fall down, we're all going to get thrown in that fiery furnace. You have to make the biggest decision of your life. Am I going to stand for God or am I going to fall? <laughs> And at some point, you just, I, I know God was in it. You just have to believe that when you choose God, he'll bless you. I'm not saying that you'll be saved from the fire like they were. I'm not saying anything like that. Uh, something interesting was brought up. I was watching a video, and it was people that were trying to prove the Bible wrong in like a protest or something like that. And the guy that was given the answer back, I never really thought about this. But he said, you know, there was a time when James, the brother of Jesus, Jesus' stepbrother, he was arrested and Herod killed him. Peter was arrested by the same Herod and put in the same jail as James was. But Peter escaped. Uh, and you have that all through the scriptures. You have one person serving God, like Stephen. Stephen dies with big rocks being bashed into the side of his head. That hurts. And that's the way he died. But then others that came, I mean, Stephen was a, of a group of seven deacons that were chosen by God to serve God. How is it that he got killed and the other six didn't? I don't understand it. So I, I never say to everybody, hey, listen, when times get tough now, if we just serve God, God will protect us through all of that because I don't think that applies to everybody. Somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to have to die for the Lord. People have done it before us. They were burnt at the stake by the Roman church. They will never be our friends. They are not our brothers. And we are not going to go along with them. Um, yeah. When I was uh, teaching at one of the, I won't say which one, but one of the churches that we were at this past few weeks, I talked about how the Catholic Church in Kenya uh, has tried to ruin and destroy our ministry. 
and we were eating some snacks afterward and this guy was talking and he said, you know, that just kind of surprises me. I said, what's that? He said, I always, he said, I always kind of see that the Catholic Church welcomes others that want to help feed people and feed the poor and so on and so on. And it made me mad. And Lisa knew I was mad. And he said, I just find that hard to believe that they uh, did that. And I went, I'm not lying. And I said it just about like that, too. And Lisa's like, I don't care. They're not our friends. But, you know, at some point, somebody's going to die for the Lord. Uh, and if you look at it like this, James got to go to heaven first before Peter did. Yeah. He's not complaining. James is not going, how come I had to die? Because Peter got killed too later on, okay? Yeah. Anyway, back to Acts. Uh, here's now Peter going, okay, I'm going to preach. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, you men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? The God, and this is something that I wish every faith healer would admit. If they would at least admit this, I might have a little bit of respect for them. But they always boast and brag that God has selected them to be the great healers of all the people. And here Peter actually healed somebody. And Peter said, this didn't happen because we're super Christians. Verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. And here he is digging again. He did it at the, at the uh, Pentecost. He did it at that sermon. He got a dig in on the Jews. He said, you killed Jesus. You crucified him. You hung him up there. And he's doing it again. He said, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed, look at him, he's not, he's not being nice. He killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. Now, uh, very quickly, I want you to turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll leave this up here for just a minute while you turn there. And I'm going to fill you in on, on something that to me is as false as a 27 cent coin. There is no such thing as a coin worth 27 cents. Or 23 and a half cents. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, understand that Peter, in verse 15, just got done proclaiming the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Um, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, referred to this as the basis of the gospel. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures now paul said that that is essentially what the gospel is and what it's based on death burial resurrection of christ so when we go back and look at what peter just said he said you denied the holy one and just and desired a murderer and he killed the prince of life jesus whom God had raised him from the dead. There's the resurrection. The reason why I bring this up, and I will continue to do this for the first seven or eight chapters of the book of Acts, 
Now, I mentioned this before, but there is, a, there is a doctrine known as dispensationalism and hyper-dispensationalism. It says that God works in different ways at different times throughout the history of the world. And many of them say, but not all of them say, that during each of these times, God has a different gospel. So like Adam was saved by a different gospel. Noah was saved by a different gospel. Abraham was saved by a different gospel. Moses was saved by a different gospel. Now we are the ones who are saved by grace through faith. But like the Jews, when they get saved here in the last days, they will have to get saved by works. And it's all a lie. And when they, when they try to argue their case, they say only Paul knew the gospel of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Only Paul knew that. Peter didn't know it. James didn't know it. John didn't know it. Jude didn't know it. They didn't know that mystery. Only Paul did. Well, we just saw, this is the second time Peter preached, and he just preached the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you go back to chapter 2, you can plainly see it. Um, yeah, therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. There's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in Acts chapter 2. And then he preached it in Acts chapter 3. Same thing. So to say that Peter didn't know it, that's a lie. But these guys, they, they get downright mean with it. And when they can't win the argument of scriptures, then they start calling me a, a uh, uh, not a hypocrite, but a heretic, that I'm teaching false doctrine, that I'm stupid. And they say, you know, we've got all these books that tell us that we're right. Well, I've got one that says you're wrong. And uh, I mean, I have, I have had big time run-ins with these people. And they do not like me at all. And the feelings are mutual. To me, they're preaching false doctrine. Whenever you say there's a different gospel, to me, that's cursed. Right then and there, that's cursed. But when we get into chapter 4, we're going to find the same thing. When we get to chapter 4, I'll point it out to you. There it is, Peter, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ again. And um, so anyway, um, avoid dispensationalism. Um, and I will say this. The pre, what they call the pre-tribulation rapture comes from that. And if that falls, I, I, one of their preachers said this in a sermon. I heard him say it. He said, if dispensationalism falls, there goes your pre-trib rapture. And he was right. Because it just doesn't work. Um, if, if there is no dispensations in different gospels, then there is no pre-trib rapture. And, and I, I have noticed from these preachers that they have to preach this just about every sermon they preach. They have to pound that into everybody. They have to keep bringing it up over and over and over and over again. It's like the priest in the Catholic Church has to keep trying to convince people that they really did just eat Jesus. And they have to keep confirming because their mouth tells them something different. Well, this tastes like a cracker with no salt. But they say, no, that's the body of Christ. You just ate the body of Christ. Okay, if you say so. They have to keep pounding it in. So anyway.